All right, sir. What's your name? John with your curly locks for crying out loud. I just want you to know you're a college student, man. I save so much money every year on product. This is a better way to go. <laughs> um, so it's, it's great to be here. I, I am a student here at University. And John, are you an undergraduate? Yes, I am. I'm a freshman. You're a freshman? Yes. And where did you grow up, sir? Michigan. Michigan? Yeah. All right. And uh, what's your football team, sir? Lions. What's that? Uh, the Lions? Lions professionally. This week was hard for me to root for Michigan or Iowa. Okay. Hard to tell. Okay. Wow. Um, You're a brave <laughs> man. Just, ins <laughs> just insult Iowa right now. Wow. Don't, let me tell you something about being a politician. You've got to pander a little bit to the hometown crowd. All right. Go ahead. Know, go ahead. Um, so you've had a great career in politics. Um, everything you've done on criminal justice, education, gun reform is, is incredible. Um, but Stay with that for a little yeah. while. <laughs> um, it's been said that people learn the most from their, from their greatest mistakes. And I was wondering if anything that you regret the most from your, from your career, and if there's anything that you feel you would have changed if you could, and, and how you've learned from that. All right, John, we're going to talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so look, I, I, I didn't take a normal road in politics. I, I, you know, I grew up in, as, a, as you heard the story, in, in some really nice suburbs, and um, I went off to Stanford University, and I confess to you I got in because of a 4.0, 1,600. 4.0 yards per carry, 1,600 receiving yards. Um, <laughs> got a football scholarship. Stayed and got my master's, went overseas on a road scholarship, studied Oxford, got back to Yale, and my dad, you would think, would be proud about this, but he's not. He's like, he's like boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> Life is not about the degrees you get, it's about the service you give. And he goes, and he, my, my mom told me this. There's a great Bible story about the, 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 the Jesus' parable about the talents. And in my book, I write about this, moral, this moment in my life where I made a decision to move to Newark, New Jersey, because my mom told me, God has given you these talents, don't make decisions out of fear. Make them out of your, what, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? That was a question my mom asked me. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Take that risk. And so I said, you know what? If I couldn't fail, I'm, I want to go to the front lines of the fight for America where the dream is being denied. And so I moved into a really tough neighborhood in Newark. And I'll never forget that God has this, I just have this wonderful view of faith. It's, faith is this idea that when you come to the end of all the light you know when you're about to step into the darkness, that faith is knowing one of two things will happen. Either you'll find solid ground underneath you or the universe will send you people to teach you how to fly. Right, and, and so I jump into to Newark, and I always say I got my BA from Stanford, but I got my PhD on the streets of Newark from people who were the best professors of my life and never had college degrees, many of them. These were wise, strong, inspiring people. And one of them, Miss Virginia Jones, the tenant president of my pro projects, I actually moved into the projects. She too, like my mother, pushed me to take on challenges that were bigger than I am. And so one of them was just to be a good neighbor. This may sound strange. You asked me about my, my political life. The times I've made mistakes is when I put politics before people. And one of the hardest stories to share with you is I'm living in these high-rise projects. Median income in my neighborhood is about $14,000 per household. And these beautiful kids, I watch them grow up over those eight years. And there was a crew of young boys that hung out in my lobby, and they were great. One of them, Hassan Washington, was literally reminded me of my dad because just like my dad, he was being raised by his grandma, four floors below me he lived. He had the same kind of wit and sharp sense of humor. He was a natural leader. Hassan and his crew hung out there, and as they got older, they got into high school, and I remember one night I come home and I smell something that I hadn't smelled that pungently since I was at Stanford. Uh, um, uh, it was pot. And let me tell you, the rules in, of marijuana in this country are very different for college students than they are for inner city African American and Latino kids. There, there, is, there is no difference. 
no difference in America for, at all for dealing drugs or using drugs. Drug use is equal amongst all the ethnicities, but if you happen to be black, you're four times more likely to be arrested for it than somebody who's white. And if you're black and poor, dramatically more. And, and so it, this is one of the reasons why I got to the Senate and immediately put a massive bill on marijuana legalization, but you should never talk about legalization. In my presence, please don't, unless in the same breath you're talking about expunging the records of people who've been incarcerated. And so, and so alarm bells go off, because these kids do not have the margin for experimentation as kids in my suburban town did. And I immediately get worried, so I tell the kids, instead of just talking to them when I come home, I say, fellas, let's do something, let's go out. You know, I'll take you to a movie and dinner. And they're like, okay. And I made the mistake of letting them choose the movie, because <laughs> the movie they chose was Saw two? I mean, it was just <laughs> awful, awful, awful. And when I sat them down at dinner, I just started asking some of my favorite questions, like, what's your dream? And what I saw with the young people, they had dreams. One of them, one of my guys, he wanted to be a, own his own automotive uh, 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 repair shop. He just loved cars. And I started realizing I could connect these guys with mentors, and I made all these plans and made promises that I would follow through. And I did a little bit of it, but then I got really busy. You know what I got busy doing? Running for mayor of the city of Newark. Wow. And, and I'll tell you, I, the campaign got so busy. When you're campaigning for an office, I don't care if it's president or mayor, you're going around the clock, you're pushing your endurance. And these kids in the lobby, when I would come home late, late at night, they would be hanging out and they would give me energy. They would tell me, Corey, we got you, we're gonna vote for you, and they weren't 18, but okay. <laughs> and, you know, one night I come home and they have all my lawn signs, they make a little parade line and to the elevator, and I'm waving to them, and they're chanting my name with the title I dreamed of, Mayor Booker, Mayor Booker. I get in the elevator, the door closes, and then I wonder, where did they get those lawn signs from, for crying out loud? <laughs> they were the greatest kids. I get elected to be mayor of the city. I win my dream job. I am now the leader of the state's largest city in a crisis too. Violence was spiking. We were about to tumble into a global recession. And I was so busy, but there were also death, death threats on my life. So they stationed police officers all around me in the lobby of the project, safe as it had ever been. But <laughs> high school kids do not want to hang out where police officers are stationed. So I lost track of the guys, but I'm now going the big job. I'm going to save every child, right? Well, in the first weeks that I'm mayor, there were lots of shootings. And, and I get called about a, a shooting down the street from where I live. And I go down there, there's a body covered up, another one being loaded in an ambulance. I barely affirm the dignity of the, of the life on the pavement. I go and minister to the living and stand there on the street corner. People crowded around to see the blood on the sidewalk. And I gave this great speech like I did early in my stays. This is not who we are. We're going to overcome this. And I went home that night to, to steal a couple hours of sleep. And back then I had a Blackberry and I'm just going through reading the reports as a brand new mayor and I see the homicide report. And I see the name of the person killed, Hassan Washington. Something broke in me that moment and it's never healed. God had put him right in front of me. He was my dad. And when my dad was like him, the whole community came in. When his grandmama couldn't take care of him, a family took him in their own home and raised him like their own children. When my father never, no college in my family history, but it was the community that said, you're going to college, teachers that spent extra time with him. And when he couldn't afford to go to college, the community swept around him and gave him enough money to enroll. I am here because of that kind of love, of people who didn't just walk past. And I had my moment, God put him in front of me, I saw the risks, I saw the concerns, I made the promises. I will never forget his funeral. It, it was at Perry's funeral home, and it was the one room that's in the basement, and I hated going down there, because it was this thin staircase, and you feel like you're descending into the bow of a ship, and there we were, all of us, hundreds of people crowding into this room, chained together in grief, moaning and groaning and swaying for what is an American daily happening, another boy in a box, in communities that when we die, they don't even write about it in the news anymore. 
And I was the mayor, I was the father of the city, and I felt such shame and such hurt, and I couldn't stay. I'm embarrassed to tell you, I left. I didn't even stay for the services. I ran out of that room, I went to the mayor's office, I slammed the door, and for the first time as mayor of the city of Newark, I sat in my office and I wept. And all I could think about was, <laughs> we were all there, crowded in that room for his death. Where were we for his life? You want to know why I started my talk about the need for a more courageous empathy, for a revival of civic grace, that it's about us and not him? It's because that's what I believe. The mistakes I've made in my life, like this one, they haunt me. I'm running for president of the United States now, but I've got lots of mentees in Newark, incredibly beautiful young kids, and I may be busy as hell, but I'm checking in with them all the time. I'm, one of my mentees just got into college. He's a freshman like you this year. The most powerful thing you can do in any day, John, listen to me, I promise you, this has proved true for my life, the biggest thing you can do in any day will always be a small act of kindness, decency, and love. It's being there for people next to you, no matter what the big mission, the big speech, the big election, those will come and go, but your life is the totality of the acts of kindness and decency and love piled up one to another that they overwhelm the world. And like that white guy on a couch in 1965, when you stand up for another American, it ripples out into history in ways like it did for my father, like it did for me, like it's done for you. That's one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn, all right?